Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, got a little bit of Adele in the background. She's asking everybody to go easy on her, and I think you ought to. Ladies and gentlemen, another GPT model is H2O. They've actually been making some strides. I've used them several times. I'm going to suggest you guys go ahead and play around with H2O. They even have a private GPT model that you can download to your computer with your files. Or let's say you download all the files on the SACCOM PDF website. And there you go. Okay. So that's just not really a plug for H2O. I liked it, but I didn't use it at first because they were a little bit more restrictive than GPT. I believe they've gotten a little bit better. Now, Adele, thank you for bringing us over here. And we're going to go ahead and stop Adele for the moment because there is something I need to talk to you about and on these type of videos. I don't play music. Yeah, we're going to delve off into the uh, scriptures, the Bible, the book of all books, the most widely distributed book in the history of mankind. Let me ask you guys a question. There are individuals who tout evolution. Now, I'm not saying evolution did not occur on some level. I'm saying it actually did. We have proof that it occurs. We have moths turning into a larva-like creature, into a butterfly-like creature. The same thing with the butterfly. We have tadpoles that turns into a little embryo-like creature in the water into frogs. So there is the evolving from one stage to another in animals, insects. But you know what we don't have in life? We have absolutely no proof of that happening with humans. Absolutely. We, we, we do have the fact that we come from two cells that come together, creates one cell, and then divides continuously, exponentially, but controlled. Not out of control, not haphazardly. You've never seen a human produce a giraffe. You've never seen a human produce an elephant. But if we are products of evolution from some mulky, murky, gobbledygook that something happened billions of quadzillions of billions of trillions of years ago, then where's the proof? I know, I know, I know. You'll have those people out there that'll make excuses. No, no, pay attention. They will make excuses because it's a theory. There are no hypotheses supporting their theory when it comes to the human species. And they will never find it because it doesn't exist. They've been looking for it. It's been too long. They haven't found it. Does that mean it doesn't exist? No, that means that they have no foundation for which to present their hypothesis. Hypotheses are based on fact, not based on theory. All theories must have at its foundation facts. Hypothesis. Is, 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 is. Most people didn't do the research, but I did. At the age of 15. I keep bringing you guys back to 15. Why? Because 15 was when I needed to know, wanted to know, and had to know what was going on. Especially with something like evolution. So I did my own research on evolution because people were saying this thing about evolution, teaching it in schools, and it was a big thing when I was growing up. They were really trying to push that in schools, and especially our school. So, there we go with that. I had a conversation yesterday 
the conversation I had yesterday was with the individual who was giving me his perspective on a few things, including some scripture. I listened, and although there were things being said that I didn't agree with, I still listened. No, 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 no. Don't think that I'm going to do that with all of you. This one was special. Okay? He garnered my attention. Not only was he and continued to be respectful, other than the fact he cursed a lot, but he continued to be respectful the whole entire conversation. And he did that from the very beginning. And he was one of the individuals I had a consult with Friday, which was two days ago. And I told him, yes, he could call me the following day. And I gave him additional information to help with what his consult was about, because that's what I do. Um, one of the conversations we had about scripture was Elijah. I want you guys to see this scripture right here. Now, we're in the second book of Elijah, and I think this is the second chapter. Let's make sure, no, the 21st chapter, verse 12. Sorry, dealing with a lot of twos. It is the second chapter we're going to go to in a minute. But this is Second Chronicles, the 21st chapter, verse 12. Notice what it says. Eventually, meaning it happened sometime down the line, a written message came to him from Elijah. The prophet saying, this is what Jehovah, the God of David, your forefather says. You have not walked in the ways of your father, Jehoshaphat, a good man. Or in the ways of Asa, a good man, king of Judah. But you walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, bad men. And caused Judah and its inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit spiritual prostitution. Ladies and gentlemen, spiritual prostitution is all of that spiritistic stuff that people do that the Bible says don't do. Consulting with spirit mediums, you know, doing these seances, uh, sitting up there practicing sorcery, witchcraft, all of that stupid stuff. The Bible calls that spiritual prostitution because God says no. Like the prostitution of the house of Ahab. And you even killed your own brothers. Yes, he killed all of his brothers. Why would he do that? Power. Money and the power. The household of your father. Who were better than you. <laughs> oh, wait. Ain't that something? But I want you to understand this. Why is this so important? That we're talking about Elijah sending a letter uh, during this time to the king of Judah. Let's go ahead and find out. We're going to click on this little footnote here. This is M. And we're going to click on that. We're going to extract. Well, no, we're not going to extract all. We're just going to go to one. Okay. And this is the second chapter. That's where I got the second chapter from. Now, pay attention. When Jehovah was about to take Elijah up to the heavens in a windstorm, Elijah and Elisha went out from Gilgal. Wait, hold on. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that Elijah was taken up to the heavens? Yeah, because the the idea that people have when they read the scripture, they believe that Elijah was somehow raptured up to the heavens. Ladies and gentlemen, Elijah was not raptured up to no heavens. We find out that Elijah was just sent to another area, and his successor, Elisha, handled the area that he was in at that time. Now, there are no more reports of Elijah after this. This is the final report of Elijah after this, so we don't get to find out when he died. We do get to find out where Elijah died, Elisha, S-H-A. We do get to find out when and where he died, because it was essential to the story. But there are so many characters in the Bible that we do not find out when they died. Why is that? Because they were not essential to the story. Their death was not essential to the story. Elisha was just, pay attention, essential to the story because he was a prophet. One of the renowned prophets. Now the conversation was, 
Elijah was later reincarnated and pay attention into John the Baptist. That's not what the prophecy said. Because if that's the case, then Jesus was reincarnated from Moses. Says he was going to raise up a prophet like Moses. And he said that there will come one like Elijah. Not Elijah, but like Elijah. That's why Jesus would say, if you would believe this, if you would believe this, he is Elijah that was to come. So let me show that to you. Give me a second while I pull that up. I'll be right back. I'm going to do something that's going to benefit quite a few of you because some of you have asked for this information, so I'm going to show you how to get it. But first of all, I had to put in Elijah to come because that is the key phrase. Look, I am sending to you Elijah. This is from Malachi, the fourth chapter. Let me make sure you can see. Where's my Malachi? Come on now. Okay, the fourth chapter, verse six. There it is right there. Anyway, I am sending to you prophecy, future. Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great, and awe-inspiring day of Jehovah. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back towards the sons and the hearts of the sons back toward fathers so that I may not come and strike the earth, devoting it to destruction. So he was sending Elijah, just like he had sent Elijah before. But was it going to be the physical Elijah or was it going to be someone with the spirit of Elijah? Now, when he says spirit of Elijah, is he talking about a physical spirit inside someone? No. He's talking about the enthusiasm, the zeal, the effort, the work ethic Elijah had. Hold on. Let's find that. Now, we have to go through several. Now, as a matter of fact, we're going to read this right here. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, speaking of John, he is Elijah who is to come. Let the one who has ears listen. These are not talking about physical ears, ladies and gentlemen. He's talking about spiritual ears. The Elijah who was to come was to come figuratively, not physically. There was no reincarnation. Now, I'm sorry, some people do believe that Elijah was reincarnated. Now, you see Malachi 4, 5, where we just were. And then we have the 17th chapter, verse 10 through 13. So let's go ahead and read that. However, the disciples put the question to him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? In reply, he said, Elijah is indeed coming and will restore all things. However, I say to you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did whatever they wanted to him. In this way also, the Son of Man is going to suffer at, the hand, at their hands. Then the disciples perceived that he had spoke to them about John the Baptist. Ladies and gentlemen, Elijah the prophet had indeed come. Because it wasn't the physical Elijah. I, I hope some of y'all ain't going to get it. And I'm sorry. I really am sorry that y'all not going to get it. Because some of y'all are so stuck in your ways. That that's what you've been believing. Okay. That's what you've been believing. Now pay attention. Even when they asked. Because Jesus asked his disciples. Who are they saying that the Son of Man is? Pay attention. <coughs> when he had come into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, Who are men saying the Son of Man is? Now, what you need to understand is Jesus was not the only one called the Son of Man. Really? Elijah was also called the Son of Man. Shh, go back and pay attention. Okay, 
Elijah was also called the Son of Man. They said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, You though, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, hold on now. Let me make sure y'all understand. They did not ever, Peter nor the other disciples, believe that Jesus was God. And notice this phrase right here. I really am going to talk about that in the future. Because there's only one living God. All the other gods are not alive. Well, Satan's alive and he's a god. No, 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 no. This phrase right here carries more than the ideal of being alive. Like I said, we'll talk about it in the future. Let's go to Mark, because I'm interested. Because there are two things that we need to show you in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. But furthermore, they said to him, truly I say to you, or excuse me, he said to them, truly I say to you, that there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they first see the kingdom of God, already having come in power. Six days later, Jesus took, remember, they will not taste death until they see this kingdom of God already having coming power. Continuing the same line of thought, same context, six days later, Jesus took those, some of them, Peter and James and John, along and led them into a lofty mountain by themselves so that they could see the kingdom of God already having come into power. Watch this. And he was transfigured before them. And his outer garments began to glisten, becoming far whiter than any clothes cleaner on earth could whiten them. Also, Elijah with Moses appeared to them, and they were conversing with Jesus. They had never seen Elijah before. How did they recognize him? By what they were wearing. There were no pictures of Elijah. There were no pictures of Moses but they could recognize them by what they were wearing. Now, this was a vision, so to speak, but it was a vision seen by four people, the three apostles plus the master, the Lord. Now, why am I showing you this? Because here is the conversation again. As they were coming down from the mountain, he strictly ordered them not to relate to anybody what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And they took the words to heart, but discussed among themselves, just those three, what this rising from the dead meant, because they didn't understand. And they began to question him, saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So he's about to explain the prophecy to them. Let's make sure. He said to them, Elijah does come first, and it restores all things. But how is it that it is written about the Son of Man that he must undergo many sufferings and be treated with contempt? Hold on. Let me make sure you understand. Remember, they were wondering about what this rising from the dead meant, and so he's explaining both to them. But I say to you that Elijah, in fact, has come, and they did to him whatever they wanted just as it is written about him. Most people don't get it. It's going to take us back to Malamachi, and it's going to take us back to Mathematu. Why? Because that's the point. However, I say to you, Elijah has already come, and they did to him. They did not recognize him, but did whatever they wanted to him. Now we're going to go to Malachi. Let's see. No, this is still Mark. This is where it's taking me back and forth. It's taking me in a loop. I don't want to be in a loop. I want to go to Malachi. Where's my Malachi? Uh, give me one second. Yep, I, I can't get to Malachi that way. We have to get to Malachi this way. Nope, it takes me. It's in a loop, y'all. I need the Malachi one. Give me one second. I'll be right there. Nope, it doesn't give me Malachi, so I can't get to Malachi that way. Hold on, let's do this. No, that only talks about John. I have to go back to Malachi on my own, ladies and gentlemen. I am sorry. We'll get here this way. Look, I am sending to you Elijah the prophet. 
before the coming of the great and awe-inspiring day of Jehovah. He's not talking about the physical Elijah. You can see by the wording, I am sending to you Elijah the prophet. Now we find from scripture that Elijah was deceased. He was not 300 years old. John was not 300 years old. There is no reincarnation in the scriptures because with reincarnation, that takes away the right of resurrection. The Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. Never did. Reincarnation comes from pagan religions. You don't believe me? Go do your research. Now, people keep telling me that they've read this book, they've read that book, and that's how they get their information. Books are written by one person. Why would you take one person's word over another? Books are written by one person. Why would you take one person's word over another? The Bible was written by 49 different people. 49. Six, six books. 66 books. 66 separate books. That's what the word Bible means. Many books. It's not written by one person. The fact is the Bible harmonizes. So the person I was talking to, he mentioned to me that there are two Jesuses, the G -G 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 Jesuses in the Bible. And when he said there were two Jesuses, we got to go to here. This is how we clear this. When he said there were two Jesuses, I was like, he said, well, the book of Matthew says that he was born in Bethlehem. And the book of Luke says he was born in Lazarus. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew is the second chapter. And the, because the first chapter talks about who begat who. Okay. So we're going to go to the second chapter. Let's go to verse number one. After Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. Okay, let's find out why he, and then we're going to go to Luke, the second chapter. Just wanted to make sure, but let's go to Micah 5.2. This is the prophecy as to where the Christ was to be born. Now, hold on. He wasn't the Christ until his baptism. That was the anointing. Why? Because anointing means called forth. Okay? Christ means called forth. Christ means anointed. So he wasn't the Christ until he was anointed. We'll talk about that in a second. Are you, O Bethlehem of Ephrath? See, there were two Bethlehems. The Bethlehem of Ephrath was the second Bethlehem. This is the place where David was born. Let's go here before we go there. We're going to go to Genesis to make sure you guys understand. Pay attention. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Okay, so let's make sure of where the Christ was to be born. Bethlehem of Ephrath. There were two Bethlehems. Do your research. The one of the two too little to be among the thousands of Israel. From you will come out for me the one to be leader of Israel, whose origins is from ancient times, from days of long ago. Now remember, this particular one that was coming has an origin. He has a beginning. I didn't say it. The scriptures say it. Most people don't want to follow scripture. They want to use their imagination. That's fine. I don't have anything to say to that. I only go by what is written. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now we get that in Matthew. So let's go to Luke, the second chapter, verse 4, and let's see where he was born here in the book of Luke. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. That's where the month August comes from, Augustus. For all of the inhabited earth to be registered. That's right, they had to go registration. This first registration took place in when Quirinius was governor of Syria, Roman governor of Syria. And all of the people went to be registered, each one to his own city. Now, Joseph had a city. Of course, of course, he had a city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to David's city, which is called Bethlehem, because he, of his being a member of the house and family of David. They were not, uh, Jesus was not born at this time. 
How do we know? And he went to get registered with Mary, who had been given to him in marriage as promise, and who was soon to give birth. So Jesus was not born in Nazareth, but they were, Joseph and Mary were living in Nazareth. They left Nazareth for Egypt shortly after the registration and then came back and moved back to Nazareth. See, the problem with the Jews, most people don't understand, wasn't really a problem. If they left their home, they had seven years to stay away from their home before returning. Seven years. So they could stay away from their home for up to seven years and not have to worry about losing their land. But if it was a family inheritance, they retained their land, never lost it. Unless the Romans came in or other nations came in and deplaced them from their homes. But as far as the nation of Israel themselves, they never lost possession of their inheritance because that was the law. So D David, not David, but uh, Joseph and Mary were able to come back home after leaving Egypt. Now, we got all of that taken care of. Got all of that taken care of. The problem is individuals don't do enough research. They will take somebody else's word for it. Uh, I heard somebody on video talking about Jesus from the time he was 12 to the time he was 30 years old because we don't hear anything about Jesus from the age of 12 to 30. They're saying that he went back and he lived in Egypt. And that's where he learned all the spiritual arts and all of that. Please, what the? <sighs> Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that don't make no sense. There is nothing in scripture that says he went back to nobody's Egypt. Nothing. But the scriptures do say that he will call his son out of Egypt. Watch this. We're going to type that in. He will C-A-L-L H-I-S-S-O-N O-U-T of E-G-Y-P-T. Okay. Let's see if it's going to recognize. No. All right. We've got to go to the watchtower because I probably didn't put the exact quote in. So let's go here. Let's see. No, don't want that one. That ain't it. I got to go back. Yeah, let's go see if I get it. Nope. I won't get it. Forefathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, sending his son. Wait, hold on. Kill foretold. Jesus showed patience by sending his son who was killed in the foretold. In the parable, blah, 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 blah. Give me a second to see if I can. Nope, can't find it that way. Give me a second. Let me go back. Let's do it this way. And you see, I know that it's, I know that it's here, but I got to find it here. Okay. See, out of Egypt, I call my son. So I just had the same phrase, but just backwards. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the book of Hosea. Hosea. Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a boy, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. This was the prophecy that he was to have been in Egypt at one time, and that one time was right here. Let's go to Matthew's the second chapter so that you can see. So Joseph got up and by night took along the young child, meaning he's no longer an infant, and the child's mother, and they went into Egypt, and he stayed there until the death of Herod to fulfill what was spoken through Jehovah, by Jehovah, through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Ta-da! That's the only time he came out of Egypt. He didn't go back to Egypt. Why would he go back to Egypt? There was nothing. He said he came there 
for one purpose, one reason only. Let's show you why Jesus came. Well, no, we're not going to show you that one. We're, some people think they know where I'm going. We're going, y'all, we, we ain't going there. We're going to Matthew. Matthew, what's going on, homie? We're going to Matthew, and we're going to go to the fourth chapter. Well, technically not the fourth chapter, the fifth chapter. So let's go to the fifth chapter. This is the fifth chapter. This is the Beatitudes. Happy and are merciful, since they will be shown mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, since they will see God, blah, 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 blah. Not really blah, 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 blah. Okay. <sighs> Do you think I came to destroy the law or the prophets? I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Truly I say to you, that sooner would the heavens and earth pass away than for one of the smallest letters or one stroke of the letter to pass away from the law until all things have occurred. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus came to fulfill the law. And as he said before, you heard me read it before, the law was to John the Baptist. That was it. There, there were no other laws produced prior to that. It was up until John the Baptist because he was the Elijah that was promised to come. Don't take my word for it. Go read it. Now, some people have been wondering. I wonder, wonder. I wonder who, who wrote the book of law. I did a video called The Truth Is Out There. Will you be able to find it? And it was about the Nevada shooting where they claimed 500 people were massacred or whatever it was. The greatest blah, blah, blah in American history. YouTube took it down because they said that I was bullying. So I went and I listened to the video again. And for the life of me, there were some actors, and I referred to the person in the vernacular of Tupac. You know, and apparently that's bullying, but who could I be bullying? I didn't say anybody's names. There were nobody's names given. Who am I bullying? A photo? That's YouTube. So I will this year be getting YouTube's attention. I need that to stay up because I'm doing something with that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to do is jw.org. jw.org. We're going to go to jw.org for a reason. Because there are several people who asked me about this particular software. Now, this particular software is free to the public from jw.org. But what we're going to do is we're going to need you guys to understand. These are the different versions of the Bible that are in here. Not all of them have references like the King James Version. Uh, let's click on just Exodus. There are no references for this. This is just the book itself. Okay? There you know. All right. However, what you're going to do is I think we can go here. We're looking for the JW Library. And it's the app. And I don't see that right there. Let's click on this right here and see if it'll get me what I need. Because I haven't gone through it this way before, and I'm just going to show you guys how to get to it. There is, it should be down here. There we go. Not that, not looking for that. Those are all the publications. And we don't want the JW Library, uh, new comparative text. No, we don't want that one. We want this one right here. We don't want the online library. We want the app. Watchtower Library. Nope, this ain't it either. Is this it? Nope, that ain't it. So I got to get to it a different way because I just got to it the other day. And let's click this. And nope, not that one either. History, history, the history. Nope. Well, these are all the apps, ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking for the actual library. So, Windows devices. There we are. This is the one for Windows. Okay? This is where you get the JW library. Okay? And this, oh, this is the Windows app. No, we want the one for the Windows 
the Microsoft Windows. We don't want that one. So start using JW app what is features uh, on Windows devices. We don't want devices. This is this is the app 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 for handheld devices. We don't want that one. Well, I mean, we do want it, but we don't want that one for the sake of this conversation. So now I have to show you how I found the actual publication. Okay, so watch this. You know what? That's exactly what I need. That right there. And I'll show it to you in a second. When we get rid of this hyphen. And we come here. Now, we can't do it that way because that's uh, Vietnamese. And so we're going to go to the frugal. And I forgot Google likes to play games. So hold on. Let me let me undo Google. I have to take all of this and get rid of it. And we do that. We want the JW library download, not the JW app download, but the JW um, library download, not the app, but the download. I think this is it. You see where it says Windows? And this one still said mobile app. But I don't want the mobile app. I want the actual library. And so that's the problem. So I'm going to have to pause y'all and I'm going to have to show y'all how I got there. For those who want it, give me a second while I take care of it. One moment. Ladies and gentlemen, I've never seen this video before, but this is a YouTube video. Watchtower Library has returned. Find out where you can download it. That's, see? Okay. So they're doing the same thing that I'm doing right now, is showing people, so one second. In April 1994, an exciting new tool was unveiled to enhance our study and research of the Bible. You have no idea the fact that it was on CD-ROM at first and how individuals like myself broke my neck to get that because, you know, we had, the internet wasn't the internet at the time. So everything was on CD, we had to download all of our programs, but to access that copy, paste, and all of that, that was essential because all the other programs you had to pay for. All these other websites that have scriptures of anything you have to pay for, you have to pay an arm and a leg. This was free. One second. This was when the Watchtower Library on CD-ROM was released. For many years, whenever a new version was released, we eagerly lined up at the literature counter to order our copy. And that is true. We were standing in a line waiting to get a copy. We had to order it, and then it had to be shipped to us. One second. With the passage of time, though, the CD-ROM format was phased out, and research resources shifted primarily to JW.org and the JW Library app. But did you happen to notice its quiet return? If you missed it, I'm happy to report that it's back. Before I show you where to find it, let's recap the different libraries. No, 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 no. We gonna have you tell us where to find it. We ain't gonna be doing no Captain of Rees. Hold on. Uh, let's, I think this might be it. One second. The choice of which library to use ultimately comes down to personal preference. And of course, you can use all three. It's up to you. At this time, though, the Watchtower library that we're discussing today isn't available for Mac users and some Windows users. Watchtower library can be installed on Windows computers running Windows 7 or later. But if your computer is equipped with an ARM processor, Windows 11 is required. Here's how to find out whether or not you have an ARM processor on your Windows computer. I have a Mac, so I can't show you, but I will explain it to you. First, click on Settings. Then, tap on the system icon. Next, click on About, as you can see on your screen now. Next, look to the left and under System Type, check to see whether or not you see the word ARM. If you do, you need Windows 11 in order to install the Watchtower Library. 
If you don't see the word ARM, you can use Windows 7 or above with the Watchtower Library. If you still have questions, feel free to ask me in the comments below or contact someone locally. Let's see where we can find the Watchtower Library now. You can also contact support at jw.org. They will, they will respond. And, or they have frequently asked questions, which is the section she's on. They give you the same information. One second. Here we are on jw.org. Scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, and there you will find Watchtower Library. Click on it. Next, click on Install Watchtower Library. On this page, you'll find detailed instructions to guide you through the download process. Thank you, young lady. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I didn't do, so now I got us to do it. Okay, I think we are, where were we? I don't know where I had it at. Where was I? With my Watchtower Library. Okay, let's go back to, oh, that's right, I, I switched off the Watchtower Library to come here. So let's go back to Watchtower Library. For those of you who are interested, we're going to come all the way down here, Watchtower Library. See, these say online, that says JW, we're looking for Watchtower Library. That's what I didn't understand. I'm apologize it and install Watchtower Library. This is for Windows, not for Mac. This is for Windows only. And you click on it and it gives you the instructions on how to download. I was just here the other day. Okay, because I want an extra copy. Now, here's this. Then you'll have to update it. How do you update it? Well, once you install it, it will ask you if you want to update it. If it doesn't ask you that, you got to go to help. You got to go check for updates or you can do manual. Now, let me let you know the update is four gigabytes. Whew, because it's a lot of information. Four gigabytes of information. And it updates itself, and it gives you all the current information. Now, this is for research purposes. A lot of people out there would like to do research. They would like to search things. So one of the publications that is good for research is what's known as the Insight Book. We're going to go to the Insight Book, volume number one, and I'm going to go all the way down to the, uh-oh, this is A's. Y'all can see there's a lot of A's because the A's have it, okay? I don't know why the A's have it. Uh, we got to go a little bit further. And we're looking for this one right here. Elijah simply means, my God is Jehovah. Eli, my God, Jah, Jehovah, my God is Jehovah. The book of Eli, <laughs> that's all it was saying, is the Bible. Okay? Y'all just need to understand, that's all they did was played on words. So there you have that, Elijah. Now, this will give you a synopsis of Elijah and so on and so forth. There you go. Now, let's see. Uh, work prophetic of things to come. About 450 years after Elijah's time, Malachi prophesied that Elijah the prophet would appear before the coming of the great fear-inspiring day of Jehovah. The Jews of Jesus' day were expecting Elijah coming for fulfillment of the prophecy. Some, prophecy. some thought that Jesus was Elijah. Some thought. John the baptizer, who wore a hair garment and a leather girdle around his loins, as did Elijah, denied that he actually was Elijah in person. An angel had not told John's father, Zechariah, that John would be Elijah, but that he would have Elijah's spirit and power to get ready for Jehovah prepared people. Jesus indicated that John did the works, but was not recognized by the Jews. After Jesus' death, a visionary appearance of Elijah, along with Moses, or excuse me, after John's death, a visionary appearance of Elijah, along with Moses, occurred in Jesus' transfiguration, indicating that there was something yet to take place in the uh, as represented by the works of, that Elijah had done. Now, again, people tend to believe without doing research. So that's what this is for. And that's why they have the scriptures here to 
back up the comment that's being said. But again, they have scriptures to back it up. They don't have, oh, go read this publication and go read that publication. And by the way, there was a gentleman named Robert B. Obra Newman who did a book back in blah, 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 that actually touches on this, please. When you're talking about the scriptures, you must use scriptures to back up scripture. Let me say it again. When you're talking about the scriptures, you must use scripture to back up scripture. You cannot just say something about the scriptures and then tell people to go read someone else's book that was written way after the scriptures were written. It doesn't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? It doesn't work that way. It never worked that way. Now, notice this. Elijah does not die at this time, nor does he go into the visible spirit, invisible spirit realm, but he is transferred to another prophetic assignment. Now, this right here, this verse, just hover your mouse over it. Moreover, no man has ascended to heaven, but the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That is John 3.13, where Jesus said no one had ascended to heaven prior to him. If Elijah had gone to heaven, like many people believe, then that means Jesus lied. When he made the statement, no man has it. Well, Elijah wasn't a man when he ascended to heaven. Lord have mercy. This is shown by the fact that Elijah does not hold any period of mourning for his master. A number of years after his ascension in a windstorm, Elijah is still alive and active as a prophet. This time, the king of Judah, or to the king of Judah, because of the wicked course taken by King Jehoram of Judah, Elijah writes him a letter expressing Jehovah's condemnation, which was fulfilled shortly thereafter. In other words, that prophecy was fulfilled. So, um... Elijah did not ascend into the heaven like so many people believe, and that is exactly what I just showed you, uh, 2 Chronicles 12, 12 through 15. Could I have gone straight here? No, because if I'm going to talk about the Bible, I have to go to the Bible first. Then I can show you this. So do yourselves a favor. It is free. You see me using it all the time. So it is free. And no, I'll say it again. I go to the scriptures first. I don't take no man's word for anything. None. So don't take mine for nothing. Go to the scriptures first. Read it for yourself. Compare it for yourself. Don't compare it with the eyes that are closed. Let him that has an ear listen. Don't read it with your eyes closed. What a preconceived idea already put in place to where you are closed-minded. Read it with the understanding as if you didn't know it at first, as if you're seeing it for the first time, and then take it for what it says after comparison it with other scripture. That's right, I said comparison it. That those, my, my phrase, my word, my collaboration. Uh, it's a collage, okay? A collage. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, not going to take up any more of your time. I just, I study scripture. For a reason. Because without it, we're lost. All these people talking about spiritual, without scripture, there will be no spiritual anything. <coughs> Let me say it again. Without the scriptures, there will be no spiritual anything. The first God we ever knew was the one written in scripture. No other book out there explains the origin of man. Now, hold on now. You have books that come across after the origins of scripture but then they talk about the book of enoch book of enoch y'all heard about the book of enoch enoch wrote a book you know who enoch was go do your research okay give me a second let me go down here so y'all can see enoch where is my enoch uh-oh went too far y'all there it is see this is enoch this is enosh Enoch. Y'all see what Enoch was? Who Enoch was? Okay, how could Enoch write a book? And it be a part of the Bible when he was the son of Cain. 
He's not the only one. There, there are two Enochs. Okay, this is the first Enoch, son of Cain. So we're not talking about that Enoch. Ah, but this Enoch was born to Jared at the age of 162. He was the 70th man in the genealogical line of Adam. In addition to Methuselah, who was born to him when he was 65 years old, Enoch was has other sons and daughters. Enoch was one of the so-called, uh, <laughs> excuse me, one of the so great of cloud of witnesses who were outstanding examples of faith in ancient times. Enoch kept walking with the true God. That's what the scriptures say. He was Moses's great grandfather. But people imagine that because he was transferred so as to not see death, that God took him to heaven because he transferred him. Enoch is not the writer of the book of Enoch. This is an uninspired, apocryphal book written many centuries later, probably sometime during the second or first century BCE. Well, hold on there. Hold on. Wait, wait, hold on a minute. Enoch is not the writer of the book of Enoch. Really? So where did the book of Enoch come from? Well, see, because Enoch was the great-grandfather of Moses, what type of paper was it originally written on? And how did it survive the flood? Hold on. I said Moses, great-grandfather of uh, Noah. If Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah, and a flood happened, how come we don't have nothing in Scripture showing that Noah took along with him the book of Enoch? And, wait, hold on now. Prior to Moses writing the Torah, the first five books of the Bible and Job, Prior to Moses writing the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and Job, where's the book of Enoch? How come Moses doesn't refer to the book of Enoch? No, 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 follow me. If Enoch wrote the book of Enoch, how come Moses doesn't talk about Enoch? How come Jesus doesn't talk about the book of Enoch? How come Jesus doesn't quote from the book of Enoch? How come Moses doesn't quote from the book of Enoch? How come none of the prophets quote from the book of Enoch? How come not even the book of Psalms quotes from the book of Enoch? How come Solomon doesn't quote from the book of Enoch? What about David? Samuel? What about Joseph? What about Jacob? Abraham? How come none of them quotes from the book of Enoch? Wait, the apostles, how come none of them quotes from the book of Enoch? But they quote from all the other books of the Bible. Jesus quotes from all the other books of the Bible. It was written. But how come nobody quotes from the book of Enoch? Oh, let me point it out to you because it was mentioned here a moment ago. The book of Enoch was not written by Enoch. It is an uninspired apocryphal book. You know the apocrypha? Something that somebody says should have been, would have been, could have been added. Hold on. Let me let me go ahead and give you guys the apocrypha. Let, let's just do that. Let's just we're, no. We're not going to look it up in here because that it's not a biblical word. So we're going to look it up here. We're going to go to the the internet of all things, and you know. It says, a apocryphal story is probably not true, although it is often told. What? Apocryphal are writings or statements of doubtful authorship or authenticity in Christianity. The word apocrypha was first applied to the writings which were to be read privately. Really? Interesting. Isn't there, there a lot of that going on? A lot of people talking about this hidden knowledge, and you can only get it by reading this and reading that? Oh, snappy wappy. Let's go to Bing. Let's see what Bing has to say about Apocrypha. Because you have the Jerusalem Bible, and I forgot the other Bibles that incorporate the Apocrypha. They even call it the Apocrypha. Okay? Now, look at this. There are 54 different books. <laughs> oh, God. Lord have mercy. A story or statement of doubtful authenticity, although widely circulated as being true. 
But there are so many people who believe in the Apocrypha. The Book of Wisdom, the Book of Baal versus the Dragon. Really? Amazing. The Apocrypha means a doubtful authenticity or of or resembling the Apocrypha, the section of the Old Testament that are not sanctioned as official canons. Interesting. So that's why I don't follow the Apocrypha. I don't read the Apocrypha. I don't care about the Apocrypha. It is not part of the canonicity. That's right. I say canonicity, not my word, an actual word. It is not part of the canonicity of the Bible. It does not follow Bible canon. It does not, like they say, authenticity. There is no authenticity as to it. Now, did the book of Maccabees, did the Maccabees actually write something? Of course they did, but not inspired. All scriptures are inspired of God and beneficial for teaching, reproving, for setting things straight. Okay. All scriptures, but not the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is not scripture because it's not part of the inspired word of God. Just that simple. Now, for those of you who don't believe any of this, K Sarah Sarah. But for those of you who ascribe to scripture, do your research. And a great, in my opinion, just my opinion, you, you're hearing it from me, a great research tool is the Watchtower Library. It doesn't cost you anything. Test it out. It's free. It doesn't cost you a dime. It is free. Then go to the Insight Book. When you go to all publications, it says Insight. Go to the Insight Book. Find a character, a word, or something. Let's go. I said, no, I'm, that's too easy. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Jehu. Jehu. I'm going to stop at Jehu. Now, I like Jehu. Jehu was an idiot in the end, but he was a very zealous man at the beginning. Okay. Jehu. We are not looking for the original Jehu. Okay. No, no. We, we are not looking for the original Jehu, the one who served at the side of David because he was an idiot. Okay, Be because he did so many things wrong, but he did so many things right, had so many great victories, but he did so many things wrong. We're not looking for the other Jehu was, who was the son of Hanani. Okay, although I like this Jehu. However, we're looking for this Jehu, the one who was the son of Jehoshaphat. Not King Jehoshaphat. This King Jehoshaphat up here that's talked about up here. No, not that king. This is the son of Jehoshaphat, who was not a king. The grandson of Nimshai, the one whom Elijah the prophet had anointed. That's the Jehu I'm talking about. If you want to learn, that's what this is here for. This is here to tell you about the three different Jehus that are mentioned in the Bible. There's probably a fourth because Jehu was not a uncommon name. There you go. There's five of them. Okay, but that's how you find that out. But wait, hold on a minute. How many of you knew this? No, 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 no. Not that you knew that there was more than one. How many of you knew that there were at least five? Because even I didn't know there were five. Until just now. That's what this type of research does for you. And technically, I did know that there were five because I did know that Hezekiah had a Jehu among the individuals. Okay, because I did remember seeing that. So, ta-da! But the rest of you, that's what this library will do for you. This is where you can start your research. Like I said, I didn't have this in most cases. I, I had to do research physically. This whole library thing, even though they had it in the 90s, I did my research in the 80s. So that means I had to have the physical books. I had to have the physical publications. I had to go to the physical libraries pull up the physical information through the physical research. They have taken all that information and put it here and this right here. Just that simple. Just that simple. They put everything here and this one's like research guide. I've never used a research guide. Oh, this is all scriptures inspired and beneficial. Okay, I know this. And then when we go to Second Chronicles and we're going to go to the 21st chapter, Get on out of the way. Get on out of the way. Get on out of the way. 21st chapter. 21st chapter. 20. 
17, 21st, come on now, 21st chapter, I think this is it. I think this is it, because, no, I don't want to find out about Jehu. 21st chapter 11, I think it was. So it gives me 12. Let's click on 12. From Elijah the prophet. Okay, so that's where it takes me to. That verse is what I'm looking for. And so I want to click here. Because this is from the Insight book. Elijah does not die at this time, nor is he taken into the visible ring. And again, remember, that's where we just were. And then we can go to, this is where it's discussed in a Watchtower magazine. However, the occurrence was a vision of Moses and Elijah, but only visionary. For Moses had died and was still in his grave, as spoken in these verses here. And this is where um, I think Peter is probably referring to Moses still being in his grave. Men, brothers, it is permissible for me to speak with freeness of speech to you about the family head, David, that he died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So that's what it's referencing. Then Elijah was carried up in a fiery chariot into the sky, but not to the heaven of God. Actually, he was transferred or transported to another assignment on the earth. In fact, years later, Elijah is still alive, and he wrote a prophetic letter to Jehoram, the king of Judah. Later, Elijah died. Just as all of mankind, neither he nor Moses was resurrected to everlasting life ahead of Christ, who is the firstborn from the dead, who is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus himself, while on earth, said, No man is ascended to the heavens, but the Son of Man who descended from heaven. And this is where it says that he's the firstborn from the dead, Revelation 1 5. And this is, No man has ascended to heaven, but he that came from heaven, the Son of Man. So that's how you will do your research. It is really that simple. And you can do the research without having to go and look at somebody's book. And if you notice, it doesn't say nothing about nobody's Jehovah's Witness and how you need to donate to the congregation $100 billion and you need to tithe and you need to do what we say. Or if you don't do it, you're going to go to hell and eternal damnation and all of that. None of that junk goes on. This is research. This is not proselytizing. This is simple research. It's called the library. That's all it is. It's just the library. Like you have a library in your study. You have a study? I have a study too. Anyway, it's a Watchtower library. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's how you get it. This is just a conversation I've been wanting to have because so many people have been bringing up so many conversations, such as the guy who I saw a video where he claims that, and I didn't finish watching it because once he said it, I knew it wasn't true. And so why would I listen to something that's not true? But he said Jesus had learned all these spiritual arts while he was in Egypt because there was no record of him from the time he was 12 until he was 30 years old. Ladies and gentlemen, there was supposed to be no record of him from the time he was 12 to the time he was 30 years old. He didn't perform any miracles at the age of 12. He didn't perform any miracles at the age of 13 because he was just Jesus, the youngster growing up. He was not anointed. He came here to be the Christ or anointed because that's what Christ means. Even the word apostle means sent forth. Pay attention, y'all. Got to go. Thank you all for joining me this Sunday morning. But it is 738. I got work to do. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye.